Okay, welcome back. Now the demo I'm going to do is also a good physics problem you can do. It's called two blocks and spring oscillation. So we're going to have a spring of a certain spring constant K. Then we're going to have two different blocks with different masses. We have here, uh, let's call this uh, little m, and we have a spring. Then we're going to call this big one big M, right? So then I'm going to stretch these uh, blocks. I'm going to put it on a frictionless surface. I'm going to stretch this block. So let's call the center of mass of these two blocks. Let's say it's going to be closer to the, the big uh, block. So this is the center of mass. So I'm going to stretch this a certain amount, right? Let's call that amount uh, A, okay? And then I'm going to stretch this a certain amount. Let's call this uh, B right here. But when I stretch them a certain amount, uh, a and B, right, um, always the center of mass of the system will always stay the same. Then I'm going to let go, and then they're going to make simple harmonic motion around the, their common center of mass, and the center of mass will never change, okay? So what are the equations of motion of this? Uh, so there's a force here pulling back on this, right, F, depending on the total stretch amount, right? So we have here F is equal to negative K, and then the total stretch amount is A plus B. And then that's equal to the mass big M times the uh, acceleration of that block, right? So then we're going to have the acceleration of that block is what? It's the rate of change of their position. And I'm calling the position of this block A. So D squared A DT squared, okay? So the A is the random amount uh, the, of stretch that uh, we've given to the block big M, right? That's the A. And then the B is the amount of stretch, the position of uh, small block B. The, the B is the position of the small uh, block M, right? So the total stretch amount at any point between the, to the, the two blocks, the total distance is A plus B. And then the force of the spring depends on the total distance between them, the total stretch of the spring, right? A plus B. The, but the position, the acceleration of this block is the the second, the second derivative of the position of block uh, M, which is the position of block M I'm calling little a, right? So then I'm going to have another force on this spring pulling it this way, right? F on the small spring, the F on the little uh, block, right? That's going to be equal to, it's to the right, right? So K A plus B times the little M times the acceleration, right? But since the, the uh, displacement of this block is to the left, I'm gonna, the acceleration is going to be negative. Okay? In other words, it's going to be initially moving this direction while that block is moving this direction. So the, the, the accelerations of the two blocks are in opposite directions, right? So the force on the block is this way, and then you have negative uh, MA. Okay, so then what do we get here? Then the acceleration of that block, okay, we can call the acceleration of that block, a prime, and then the acceleration of that block is the second derivative of the position of that block, which I'm calling B. So then I have here K A plus B is equal to negative M, the second derivative of B with respect to T, right? So then what, what would be the general uh, solution of the position of block uh, M, right? A of T, we're going to say, is the amplitude, the uh, total amplitude the maximum amplitude of block M, right, sine of omega t, right, and then we're trying to calculate the omega, and then the position of the little m is going to be b of t, is going to be b sine of omega t, right. They're going to oscillate with the same frequency, their omega is the same. The only thing that might be different, the only thing that will be different is their total amplitude, the maximum amplitude a and b, right. So then if I take the second derivative of that, the first derivative of A with respect to T is going to be A W cosine omega T. The second derivative of that is going to be negative A W squared sine omega T, right? And then the second derivative of this is going to be likewise, second derivative of B with respect to T. So it's going to be negative B omega squared sine omega T, okay? So now let's put that in here. We get K A plus B is equal to M A W squared sine omega T. Okay? So then uh, we're going to get something similar for this part. 
Then now you can see the Ka plus B, the Ka B plus B, which is the force on the two strings, is going to be the same force. So these two are going to equal. So from there, we're going to come up with a, a certain expression. So then we're going to get big M A omega squared sine of omega T is equal to M B omega squared sine of omega T. Right, so then what we, what we get here, the omega squared and the omega squared cancel, sine and sine cancel, we get big M A is equal to little M B. Well, this gives you a relationship be, uh, uh, with uh, total amplitude of the block uh, M is A, right? And then this is the little mass. So this basically is a center of mass conservation. This is telling us that the center of mass is always conserved. The smaller mass will have a bigger amplitude. The, it will oscillate uh, back and forth more around its common center mass. The bigger mass will have a smaller amplitude. So that makes sense. The bigger mass will have a smaller amplitude. So, okay, then we're going to take this and put it back into either equation. We can put it back into this equation or this equation. But this equation, I have to correct it a bit because this is the time-dependent variable A as a function of T, and this is the time-dependent vari variable B as a function of T. So I have to put those functions in, right? So I have to say K, the A as a function of T was A sine of omega T, and then B as a function of T was big B sine omega T, right? That's equal to M A omega squared sine omega T. So what will happen is the omega T portion will cancel out, and you'll get K a plus b is equal to m a w squared, right? So then I can say a is equal to little m b over big M, and then just substitute it into here. So look what's going to happen. If I divide this by big A, big A and big A, so we're going to have here w squared m is equal to k1 plus b over a, right? So then we can see from here that the ratio of B over A is equal to big M over little m. So it's just a matter of a ratio thing. So take the ratio of big over, uh, B over A, you get big M over little m. 1 plus big M over little m, that's equal to big M omega squared, right? And then we just have a couple more steps left to calculate the, the radial frequency of the oscillations. So we just, uh, we can take this and in a common denominator, say k little m plus big M, okay, divided by, and then the little m is the denominator, and then the big M comes down here, and then we have here omega squared is equal to k. So basically you take the sum of the masses divided by the product of the masses times the spring constant, and then you can take the square root of this, right? And then the period of the motion is going to be 2 pi over omega, Okay, so let's see, let's test this equation. We're going to have two gliders of different masses, and we're going to have a spring of a certain spring constant. So the first thing I'll do is I'll connect this uh, force sensor to my GLX Explorer. So as I've shown before, uh, this one generates a graph of uh, force versus time when you open it. And then you press play. You press play, and then you zero it by pressing this button here. Okay? And then you stop it. And then you can take, uh, right now, if I just lay it like this, yeah, the bottom of the spring is at the three centimeter mark. That's its natural length, three centimeters. So I'm gonna stretch it by about 20 or 30 centimeters, okay, so right here, that's how you stretch it, 30 centimeters. Then I press play on the force sensor, and that's going to tell me how much force it takes to stretch the spring by 30 centimeters, okay. So then I can press play again. And then I can find the average force. It took 1.12 newtons of force. One point one two newtons to stretch it by 30 centimeters, so that's 0.3. So that will calculate for us 1.12 divided by 0.3. Right? 
So that's going to be the spring constant of the spring. Okay. That's the spring constant of the spring. Then we're going to put this on the air track. Okay. The two gliders we're going to use are this, this red one, and I've measured the mass already. It's 293 grams. The big M is 293 grams. And then the little M is the mass of the small glider. That one is going to be 141 grams. 141 grams. Okay, so now let's connect them with the spring and then put them on the uh, air track. Okay. So we also want to we also want to level the air track so it doesn't go to one side. So I'm going to lower this side right here. Okay, now that I've leveled them, I can do the oscillations. One, two, three. So 1.65 seconds for three oscillations. One, two, three. 1.65 again. One, two, three. 1.77. You can see the energy of the oscillations dissipated so quickly. I had to do only maybe three oscillations before it kind of died down to the point where I, I didn't see oscillations. So I repeated it three times. I got about 1.6, 1.7 range. Okay. So the experimental period, we're going to say, T experimental is going to be 1.65 divided by 3. So then what is that going to be? 0.55, right? 0.55 seconds is the experimental period after uh, doing it a couple of times. So now the theoretical period is going to be 2 pi, the product of their masses, okay? So if we're going to be here, 2 pi. So in order for this to work, you should convert to kilograms. The mass is going to be 0.293 kilogram times 0.141 kilogram divided by the spring constant was spring constant was 3.7 newton per meter right and then multiply that by the sum of their masses 0.293 plus 0.141 okay so let's see what we get here 0.99 seconds so the theoretical period is uh, larger than the experimental period. So I probably had a lot of error in being able to tell the oscillations and maybe I didn't count actually three oscillations when uh, I thought I counted three, maybe I only counted two. The dissipation in the energy of the oscillations was so big that I wasn't able to tell good oscillations from it. But you can see now we are somewhat in the ballpark, but this problem shows you the good a problem, a good physics problem of how to calculate the period when there are two different blocks of different masses with a spring constant, right? Now, what would the equation be if they were the same masses? The equation will be more simplified, right? We can come up with an equation for the period if you have two blocks in the spring, but the blocks of the same mass. So if little m is, e is equal to big M, right? If little m is equal to big M, then what's gonna happen? The period is going to be 2 pi, little m, little m, over k, little m plus little m. And then you're going to end up getting 2 pi square root of m squared over k 2m. And then the mass is going to cancel. So if the period is going to be 2 pi square root of m over 2k. Right? Now, if you have just one block and a spring, what's the equation? Just one block with a mass m, the equation is 2 pi square root of m over k. So then what's happening, right? If you have two blocks with the same spring versus one block with the same spring, well, what should happen? Well, because of the root two here, right? So we can say t, the period is equal to two pi over root two, root m over k, two pi square root m over k, this is the period that one block would have had over square root of two, right? So if you have just one block, the period is gonna be this, but if you have two blocks, the period is going to be a shorter by this amount. So T1 block over 1.414. So actually, these two are going to go back and forth quicker than one block would have done. Why? Because the mutual force between them, right, the extension is going to be more. 
and when you st stretch one by one amount, you will naturally stretch the other one by the, the same amount, right? So when one stretches by one amount, the other one stretches by the same amount, the force of the spring is greater on them, right? Even though the combined mass of the system is larger, but the force of the spring is also larger because of the extension amount of both of them, right? So it ends up that these two go back and forth with a shorter period than this single one does, right? That's an interesting case that we learn from this example. Two blocks that are heavier go um, oscillate at a quicker rate than one block connected to a spring, okay? So with this uh, example, you see a nice example of oscillation theory, okay? Again, and the center of mass, and uh, you also see a little bit differential equation, and then you actually can run the experiment and then compare the experimental result with the theoretical. Thank you very much.